I'm Kate Gardner. I'm the founder of Grey Horse. We're a communications agency based in New York, usually. I'm reporting live from Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And today I'm excited to talk to Quinn Mai, uh, founder of Moving Image and Content, uh, Sam Slaughter, founder of Lighthouse Creative, and Bonnie Kinser, who is the CEO of Trusted Media Brands, which has media uh, brands under it, including uh, Reader's Digest, Taste of Home, and many others that we all recognize. Um, and now that we're in this interesting and strange new era, uh, I think one of the things we wanted to talk about was sort of the future of content and the future of marketing and the future of the intersection of those two things, um, both from a consumer perspective. So why are you reading it? Who is reading it? Why are they reading You know, where are they coming from and, and what are they doing with the content if it has, to, if it's of service or are they just enjoying themselves? Um, the other side of it is really the content economy. You know, it, we had made a content economy and we have lots of people consuming lots of content, but as we all know, the media model has been wildly disrupted in the past 20 years and particularly in the last five, that's starting to show uh, as we have fewer and fewer outlets out there. Um, but first I'm gonna let everybody talk a little bit about what they do and introduce themselves. Um, Bonnie, what's... You are cutting out on me. Uh, but I think you asked me. Am to I? I'm sorry. So I will. Introduce um, yourself, Bonnie. Go uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am Bonnie Kinser, the CEO and president of Trusted Media Brands. As Kate said, uh, Trusted Media Brands is a portfolio of many, uh, many trusted brands, uh, including Taste of Home, uh, Family Handyman, uh, Reader's Digest, Birds and Blooms, and a bunch of others. We have a footprint of about 50 million view viewers that come every month to our websites. And of course, on the print side, we have about 40 million uh, readers. So um, we have a, a definitely a heartland uh, brands and actually most of our employees are in Milwaukee, uh, not too far from where Kate is in Lake Geneva. And uh, we have offices just outside of Minneapolis and Manhattan uh, and as well as uh, White Plains. Um, Quinn, why don't you talk about moving image and content? No, I swear Kate didn't ask me because I had the word content in my company's name. I probably <laughs> um, But certainly, um, I started my agency 10 years ago, really helping brands and organizations um, tell stories, talk about their products, talk about their brands through storytelling. And content for me now means everything from, you know, a 160 character tweet to an animated GIF, to a TikTok challenge, to a game in Fortnite, and you know, um, a wardrobe change in you know, um, Animal Crossing. So when you think about content today, it's really about how you show up in the world and how you communicate who you are. And I think during COVID, it's become even more important. I was really happy to hear that Bonnie's, um, you know, her businesses are just more important than ever because the only way we can actually relate to each other other than through Zoom meetings like this is through content. So how do we actually think about telling stories and sharing um, our values and beliefs and our interests with each other? And, and it's through, through storytelling that's now based on a plethora of multimedia types of you know, communications that are online. I mean, that, and it's really interesting. I, I think that even though I joke and say that I started my company before the iPad existed, guys, that's a long time ago. Um, but so much has changed since then. So I think we're actually in the early days of content creation and communications because it's been such a top-down model between brand authority telling you, and now it's community-driven, coming back up the other way. And so this is a whole nother world that we're moving into. Um, so I work with a lot of traditional brands um, like Jaguar and Tiffany, um, but also with brands like Google, who actually, believe it or not, as a tech company, have a hard time telling stories, um, telling them who they are. So I work with, the, we, we, you know, my company, my agency provides marketing strategies, strategic work, insight work for um, global brands trying to move into this space. Awesome. And Sam, uh, it sounds like you guys have some simpatico, actually. We're totally simpatico. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm Sam Slaughter. I... But, before we start, I have to say that I usually smile a lot and I laugh on these things, but I got bit by a dog this weekend, my friend's dog, so my, my face won't let me smile. So I don't have RBF. 
I just have an injury in my grill. Um, so my background is I was the co-founder of a content marketing tech platform called Contently that had, um, you know, there was a big network of freelance creatives that we matched up with brands. And then a couple of years ago, I left to start an agency, which is called Lighthouse Creative, which is not quite the same thing, but the same output. We, um, we're a bunch of sort of editorial, <clears throat> editorially minded um, writers, designers, and um, video producers. And we focus on just sort of content execution for brands and media companies. So um, sometimes that means, you know, sort of like very, very top funnel editorial type consumer facing stuff. And that can, and sometimes it can mean really boring stuff like sales presentations and keynotes and decks and stuff like that. Um, so we work closely with about 10 to 15 brands. Um, and a lot of them, most of them are tech and a large number of them are B2B, although they're not all B2B. And so we, we are sort of approaching content, um, partly from like a mass market standpoint, but also from like a very specific, uh, like marketing deliverable and ROI standpoint, which I think um, hopefully will be a good counterpoint to these guys. Awesome. Um, so Bonnie, one of the things that you had said was that you've seen a lot of consumption uh, shift towards a variety of, of diverse products. Can you talk a little bit about both what you were seeing and then what you are seeing now that we're in the pandemic apocalypse? So I think, you know, we have seen digital traffic grow across all of our brands. I think for um, Taste of Home, which is our largest site, um, we saw a tremendous amount of, um, of growth as all food sites did. And so you begin to just learn like what's on people's minds, right? People really wanted to figure out how to make bread. They wanted to figure out how to make tortillas. And I think that was just interesting for us to see what was important to people as they were home. I think the other big winner, which was I think a little bit more unusual was Family Handyman. Um, and you could say it's not unusual in retrospect, but for us at that time, it was, um, you know, really exciting to see that people realized, oh my gosh, I am stuck at home. I should probably use it as an opportunity to get through that honey-do list. And we have broken traffic records month after month on Family Handyman, and that's just made the team, you know, obviously really jazz to realize that our content is so valuable and so important to people while they're home. And um, so we continue to see that. And I think Reader's Digest also broke records with a lot of just helpful information. And I think Reader's Digest is one of those brands, no matter who you are, it just makes you feel better about the world and very trusted. And, you know, whether it's an inspiring story or, you know, some helpful hints, I think that the brands really play a role in today's um, stuck at home, if you will, uh, environment. And so we continue to still, to still see um, incredible um, records of, of that traffic. That's awesome. Um, Quinn, are you seeing that, that the brands that you're talking to are, are changing their strategies to be more of service or, or what, are, what are your clients doing? Well, you know, um, it, it's it's been difficult for a lot of brands to move into that, you know, Bonnie, and I think you're right, like, for somebody to consume your content, it has to either be wildly entertaining or of service. And I think that a lot of brands um, have traditionally done very self-serving content. You know, look at how amazing I am. Look at how cool I am. Look at how, like, look at my, it's almost like, you know, use car salesman, check out my ex. Um, and I think what's happening is that, organic reach has all but disappeared. You know, I think the average engagement rate on Instagram is like 1% for brands, which is so dismal, um, that now they're being forced to be more of service. Now, beauty brands were really great, you know, in the beginning of, of moving into that arena, like how to's and educational information. But I think the, the other brands are starting to struggle quite a bit, um, whether they're automotive or fashion, um, Tech brands have a little bit of a better example because again, they can do how to's, but I think a lot of brands are struggling on how to weave their product into a, um, a piece of content that is of service. So, you know, you, you know, I think everyone joked about, you know, all the COVID ads, they looked exactly the same. They mm -hmm. all sounded the same. They were of service to the community, but they were totally vapid. 
Um, and I think that a lot of uh, you know people with Black Lives Matter are saying to brands too, be authentic and real. You know, do something that is that's really going to make impact. Um, and I think we're in a new world today. You know, um, I, I said to my husband to the other day, I said, you know, I always thought that there was going to be a pre-COVID and a post-COVID, kind of like you got really sick and then you were better. But now we're realizing that there's no post-COVID. It's just a new way that we're going to live. So I think living um, with empathy is going to be really important. And with that, brands are going to have to be more of service because otherwise, why would anyone give you the time of day? You know, um, unless you're serving me something wildly entertaining or something, you know, somewhat educational and of service to my life. Mm -hmm. Sam, how's that being reflected in the work that you guys deliver? Yeah, I think like Quinn, you sort of like hit it really like the nail on the head in the sense of like, <clears throat> they are starting to realize that they need, that the stuff they create needs to be of service. Where they struggle is to like understand how to be of service without being self-serving. If that makes sense, it's like, you have all these people who are used to sort of like pushing content, salesy content out and it's kind of like talking about themselves and talking about their product who are being forced to sort of like recalibrate to think of it, you know, to, to think of what they're doing from a user perspective um, as opposed to, you know, from their own brand perspective. And so I think like that shift is happening. And like I said, like we're like largely in the B2B space, which is, kind of always paid lip service to this idea of like service content and there's there's kind of like a like a playbook um of how to do it and yet like so many people have so much trouble with it and actually what i've found in the last few months is covid's really helped us to like make the argument to people to be less self-serving right it's like Hey, look, have you noticed that nobody else is doing what you, you're, you're telling us you want to create this stuff that's about your product and about how great it is and about how amazing like your company is. And yet, have you noticed that like mm, nobody else is doing that? Um, so I think that it's, it's a slow shift, but it's like a meaningful shift um, in a, in, in a good direction. Um, that's kind of, I guess that's kind of like where, like how I'm seeing it reflected, I guess. Um, and that's on down to like stuff that you give to salespeople to lead conversations with, right? Like instead of it, instead of it sort of being these like fact sheets and sales decks, it's like, hey, like let us be consultative to you about what the problem is because we realize that kind of like, you know, we're the ones that have to help like the there's no one coming to help us like and so i don't know i i like i think that brands are starting to sort of embrace that a little bit which has kind of been nice to see yeah and um just to add on to that sam what we're really saying to our brand partners is you know in order to cut through the clutter which is the biggest hurdle um i think bonnie your your group really creates you know content that attracts people um, most brands can't attract people unless they have like, you know, unless it's Peloton, <laughs> you know, um, but thinking about first your, your, your main campaign or your main communication has to be really about awareness and connection first so that you can actually like grab anyone's attention and then you can do the lower funnel stuff like the retargeting, the product ads that are more just basic, you know, um, you know, you know, content that really pushes your product as a secondary thing but if you can't attract people's attention or get people to even pay attention to you at all you have no awareness to build your business on and i think that's something that a lot of brands are starting to understand now is that you know when they want it to be to your point sam very self-serving about like how great my product is you know there was no view through rates people were really dropping out of those videos there was like almost no click through rates consumers are just so bored with that sort of level of marketing that now you mm -hmm. think about it in two prong. What's your awareness piece, which is just really you know more of service, and then you can target leader because you've won their love and they've you won their their respect to then try to sell them your X product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's been interesting to me, and I wonder like Bonnie, how this is sort of reflected as somebody who's like, you know, producing like so much more content than like the, than like a typical, you know, than a, than a non-media brand would. It's like this balance between acknowledging 
both that like things are totally abnormal, but also that there's a desire to like create a space of normalcy within them. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. I think, I think that is a, a, a great way to say it. It is, it is that balance. And I think each of our brands handle it differently. Um, so, you know, Taste of Home created a great fun little logo, which was Taste Stay at Home, which, you know, early on in the virus, which was just a reminder of like, we're here for you, but you also need to do your part, you know, and, and be home. And I think that they do a balance of like recipe collections that would be specifically because you're home and you have to feed your kids every single meal versus things that they would do for, um, you know, a celebration of sorts. And, I, you know, so I think they, they do look at that balance of, of content creation, um, which, which they have to. And I think it's genuine because I go back to some of the things that uh, you have both said, which is that if your brand loses its authenticity, um, the, the, the customer knows. And so Taste of Home can do, um, here's, you know, 20 easy meals to serve your kids while you're home because, well, they would do that anyway. Now they're maybe doing 20 instead of five or the best, but that would be the way they would be talking. Now, it, now it's like 400 recipes. Yeah, 400. <laughs> you feed your kids at home forever. <laughs> on, a, on a related note, Bonnie, how does this work out for your advertisers? I assume that they're excited that you have so much more traffic, but what are they Yeah, doing? I think, you know, I think the advertising community, obviously the traffic is very meaningful for them. And most of all for us is our engagement, right? Because our engagement rates are really high. So it's not just about having a lot of people, it's what are they doing with, you know, within your community. So that's a real plus. And uh, you know, just one quick example, we were working with Dole Pineapple before COVID. Um, and they came back to us after COVID because they want to have that relationship to go back to the consumer. And because people are cooking so much, it's an opportunity. If you have to cook all of those meals every week, you know, make it a little bit more festive by putting some pineapple in. I think that they want to be, that's like a great example of like, we want to be around the people who are really cooking and want to make sure that their family is happy. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's there's got to be a, a part of it where you're kind of starting to establish new preferences because all of these folks who didn't used to cook are now trying to figure out, you know, yes, bread and sourdough as we all have seen on Instagram, but also just sort of all of the stuff that Betty Crocker used to do um, by establishing her brand as like the go-to for 1950s, 1960s cakes, for example. My family yeah. has been the same cakes for 50 years or something. Right. But I think, you know, another example is Sherwin-Williams, right? So we, they pulled a campaign with us um, in May, which was obviously very devastating to our team. But then when they started doing curbside paint pickup, well, what better partner than Family Handyman to let everyone know that not only could you pick up your food, you could actually pick up your, your paint. Yeah. Uh, so I think having those relationships really, really works as, as marketers come back with their message. Mm -hmm. So we, we've talked a little bit uh, on our pre-call around budgets and budgeting. And I know, Quinn, you had some thoughts. I'd love to hear what we think uh, is going to happen in the next few months as, as the recession, depression, COVID circle continues. Are we seeing uh, cuts already or are we just anticipating that in the next six months, all sorts of things are gonna change? Um, I think we've seen, I mean, I can only speak for my client base. We've, we've already seen a couple of waves of cuts since March. Um, certainly the first wave, just the panic wave, <laughs> you know, um, then the fear wave and then the how do we make up these this year's like shitty numbers wave so like you know i think most of the brands that i've spoken to have had a couple waves already um i think everyone is starting to realize the new normalcy which is we're not going to come back to a pre-covid day we're just all adjusting our lifestyles until some sort of vaccine comes into place and especially in the u.s where there are so many more hot spots so i think brands are now coming back to the point where they can't be frozen anymore and that was a lot what was happening like you said bonnie everyone just cut everything they could because they didn't know what was going to happen and now that we know that the new normal is i think they call it um the hammer and the dance where you go in and out of quarantine constantly in and out brands are now saying okay i have to just live with this new normal and figure out how to adjust 
So what we're seeing is definitely you know, a huge shift to digital, almost 100%. Um, the, the other money, you know, TV and digital, um, I would say the other monies that used to go to outdoor or experiential has totally, of course, disappeared. Um, celebrity partnerships have shifted a lot, celebrity influencer partnerships, because now they're looking for reach and, and engagement to your point body and not just a huge fan rate. Um, I think people are now realizing how important engagement is, um, mm -hmm. that just views, impressions alone aren't moving the needle. Um, and I think they're also realizing the power of advocacy and word of mouth. So they're putting a lot more money into how do we build a community around us and not just get eyeballs. Um, the things that are really suffering, and I'm seeing this, you know, amongst my peers is um, production has become so commoditized. You know, like, you know, I think um, it, it has been over the last few years, but now that everything is sort of like shot on iPhone, you know, production has really become much more commoditized. And what was really interesting through is that during the, the isolation phase and during the shelter in place, so many people were shooting on iPhone and documentary style. A lot of brands in the luxury space were even doing it. And to their surprise, when they launched it, it actually did better than the content mm. that they made that was really polished and um, refined. So I think that's gonna be a huge shift in budgeting. Um, where uh, lo-fi documentary will actually probably rule much more because it performs better. It makes people feel like it's trusted. You know, it feels editorialized, it feels real. Um, so I think the biggest um, shift is actually going to be in production, you know, having people shift to, you know, before it was about cheaper, you know, production value. Now it's actually moving towards more transparent, honest, and more productive content is the one that is feeling more uh, documentary style and more real. So I think that's where um, production companies and directors are going to be more hurt um, because that's shifting towards what consumers want to see, which is more authentic, real content. And if you think of the rise of TikTok, right? If there was ever a polished video on TikTok, you would just you know, freak out because it just feels so wrong to you. Um, and I always say that, you know, TikTok of the avocado toast <laughs> you know? uh, and the pink walls of Instagram, because you just can't physically look at that anymore and think that it's real, you know? Um, so I think those are where we're, we're going to see a lot of shifts. So I think it's going to be more, more, more faster, um, cheaper, but because it's more effective and more trustworthy actually. So I think that shift is really coming faster than I anticipated. And especially for, we work with a lot of luxury brands, even they are embracing that notion, which is they're the last to do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's gonna be the big shift financially too. Um, why don't we, uh, Sam, from your perspective, what, what are you thinking about this stuff? I know you directly produce a lot of content for folks like Amazon. Yeah, it's been interesting. So we are, I think, a little, our clients are a little, they're, they're a little less exposed than Quinn's clients because I think most of our, our clients are in tech. Um, that said, I think, look, like everybody's exposed to the same stuff. Um, my sense has been everything's on pause. Like, it's not like they've decided to, like, do major budget cuts, but any sort of, like, project of any size has been paused since three or four months ago. Um, and I think the com we sort of, you know, we have all these ideas out there, all these things that people want to do, and we sort of continue conversations and they're, and they're all in this sort of like holding pattern. Um, and what's going to be interesting, I think, is like for, for a lot of these guys, they start their 2021 budgeting now. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, like we got to figure out what we want to do, you know, next year. And like, is this rebrand going to happen? Like, are we going to shoot this commercial? Like, and they're, they, you know, they don't know. Um, I think that they, the sense that I'm getting at least so far um, here on July 14th is that people are planning to go into 2021, like with a, with a relatively like, with the plan that things are going to be at least from a marketing standpoint back to normal um and they're they're sort of they sort of have that luxury because they're because they're largely b2b and because they're largely tech but i do think that they're 
that's kind of the feeling that I get. Um, I think that at like Q3 projects, Q2 projects are going to get, are, you know, still on hold indefinitely. But I think 2021 budgeting will go about as if it was relatively normal. And I also think like, and this is just, you know, I'm talking a little bit out of my ass here. Like, I don't know this, but I think that people are going to have, there's going to be this sort of like Q4 freak out. Like, I think Q4 is always a big quarter for kind of marketing. And given that there will have been two quarters before of like just garbage, like garbage growth and like no business and whatever, I think that people are going to sort of feel this huge pressure to make up all their numbers in Q4 and to invest all of this money in marketing. Um, maybe I'm like an optimist also, but I, I think that that's coming. Um, knock on wood. I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I, our business, all of our conferences business has shifted completely online. And so one of the things that's been really interesting about that is yeah, these virtual panels, we do a lot of them for us, we do them for clients, we do them all over Turnation, but all of that budget is still sort of loosely hanging out. Um, and to me, a lot of it, if it, it still exists, if the company didn't make all that money, um, those folks are trying to figure out where to spend it. And I think that there's an opportunity more for experiential stuff online. I think that there's a lot more opportunities for Twitch, for all of the other uh, platforms we've been considered an indulgence up to this point. Um, Queen, you mentioned TikTok earlier. Um, what's going on there? Um, I think it's the fastest growing app in history, which is very, you know, surprising. And I think what's happening too is that um, it's changed the playing field of who can make content, you know, and it's really moved it away from the hands of um, traditional creatives, you know, directors, photographers, um, influencers, I would say, I would say influencers are a lot of professional creatives and put it in the hands of everyday people. Um, you're seeing, you're, you're seeing people amass followings at such a rapid rate um, mm -hmm. and you're seeing a lot of sub communities come out of TikTok too. You know, like you call it alt talk, alternative talk, where you see, mm -hmm. um, you know, LGBTQI plus communities come out of it. Um, you know, uh, weird niches like political alt talks. You know, where it's all about politics. There's like um, a lot of um, social activism is coming out of TikTok too. And I think it's the power of Gen Z, which is their 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 need to be creative and to be in control of the messaging rather than be given the message. Um, and I think that a lot of people are sort of saying, oh, that's Gen Z, that's over there. But I think that the couple of Gen Z being so active on Twitter, which is like just the news making cycle, you know, platform of our mm -hmm. generation, the, the power of TikTok, which is real creativity and the power of Twitter, which is this new cycle, those two things combine, it's like this force multiplier, which is changing culture so fast. Um, mm -hmm. I think that TikTok, you know, often is relegated to like, oh, that's for people who are targeting Gen Z, but I think it's really changing culture in, in really fundamental ways. And I think, you know, the joke of um, the TikTokers who signed up for Trump's rally, right, as a gag, I, I think you're going to see a lot more of that ha happening going on because it's the power of community that's really going to um, to continue to grow, to see what they can do together. Bonnie, how is that changing your business? Are you adopt rapidly adopting new platforms? Are you continuing on? Uh, you know, we do, uh, we do, we are not big in TikTok. We do some, Taste of Home does some fun stuff, but um, for us, you know, it's always very important to know who the consumer is. Like that is definitely, you know, a guiding principle for us. We want to have a direct relationship with people that we communicate to. So um, Facebook is obviously very strong for us and we have a very huge newsletter business, um, which we love. And we really, we want to know who you are and you want to know that we know who you are. And that's important to us. So we, we always dabble. We love to try new things. It's, it's important for your creativity. But in terms of really building our business, we, we want to have a relationship um, with you. Uh, and so we might work with a lot of different partners. We just, um, 
we're about to announce the winner of the Reader's Digest, Nice Places in America, which I was a judge <laughs> for. So if you ever want to like, when you're feeling a little bad for yourself, I can send you all 50 nominees because we have a best winner in every state and it really warms your heart that there actually are good people out there doing good things. <laughs> uh, you know, we partnered with Nextdoor um, and we got thousands of submissions between our own site and Nextdoor. And, um, you know, that's just, again, it's a way of, uh, you, you, we want to have that two-way, two-way dialogue. Um, so we always look for ways to build that. I, I, I hear you. I think it, it, the two-way dialogue thing has been something that I've been harping on now since like 2009 or something. And, and it, it's, it's, it's complicated because it is so much work. I always, I always cite the New York Times having like 20 or 30 minimum content humans who manage the community. It's nothing to do with editorial production. It's everything to do mm -hmm. with figuring out what to do with their social platform. Um, and on a case by case basis, it, you need to put as much effort into those as you do into any other distribution metric. Um, and yes. when you can, yeah. it's so instantly uh, obvious when you, when, when you're not doing that, when you're not investing your resources in, in really meaningfully engaging with brands. Uh, right, or, you, can't or, do, you can't do everything, you know? So we have a very large Facebook community and that's an important community and they, you know, are constantly communicating with us. We wouldn't want to just let that go. Um, so I think you have to, you can't do things half-assed because you'll get called out in a nanosecond. And you use the phrase call out, which brings me to the epic question. Uh, in this era of call out culture um, and cancel culture and many different kinds of culture that are very complicated to wrangle, uh, how are you helping, if at all, uh, your clients and, and your brands to engage with those narratives? Um, I think one of the things that I'm seeing is a lot of brands rang really hollow and didn't really invest in it. Um, and that's coming up to haunt them. Um, Quinn, are, Quinn, are you talking about any of the social movements and the way they impact your advertising marketing? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think that the the recent lockdown has, you know, I'll go right to this word empathy has created like empathy across every level. Um, I think that for a lot of times, you know, in the past years, especially with the rise of Me Too and the the need for you know racial inclus inclusivity, I think that for so many times. Um, I hate to be jaded, but I would be in meetings where it was almost like, okay, do we, do we have the inclusive? Do we have this? It was almost like a checkbox that people said, do we do this? Um, but I think with COVID and, and Black Lives Matter, and again, more so our, our U.S. clients, um, a little bit more our, for our international clients, but definitely U.S. clients are now saying, okay, how are we really accountable? Um, I think what's really scary about call-out culture is that um, you don't give brands or people the chance to say that I'm on the route to improvement. It's like a zero sum game. I either, you are, you're either woke or you're not, and then you'll be canceled. And what scares me about that is, you know, with organizations or even with people, right? You've seen a lot of um, uh, people in media called out, for example. And certainly some people deserve to be called out full stop. But then there are those who are trying, but definitely are not there, but they're on the road. Um, you know, inherent racism is so pivotal throughout our country that even um, my son is actually black. He's um, from Ethiopia. And, you know, as, as he was growing up, he was being indoctrinated of being racist against himself because of media and things were going. So I think we have to just forgive people that if they're on the route, the road to the right thing, we need to give them a sense of forgiveness and cancel culture has made that really hard. So sadly, what I've seen a lot of the brands do and, and brands also that we work with is issue a somewhat heartfelt apology but, and say, we're going to do these things. But I think what's going to happen in the next three to four months is you know, how, are, how are we gonna make them accountable? Um, because in August of 2019, I don't know if you guys remember, 200 CEOs signed a letter saying it's not just about stockholder value, it's about, you know, value across the entire ecosystem. And I want to go back to, I want to actually call out those CEOs and say, have you done anything about it? <laughs> um, so I think, you know, in about six months, there's going to be this huge reckoning of saying, okay, you posted that thing on Instagram, have you really done it? Um, mm -hmm. But I think right now we're in this very, you know, pivotal phase where, 
call it culture is, is drowning out a lot of incremental change. Um, and that's a little sad for me. I think it's important that people and brands are held accountable, but incremental change is better than no change. And it is going to take a long time for us to dis dismantle racism or inequality as it has been, you know, um, the Me Too movement. I mean, that's been now a long time and it's still coming. So I think we have to all be a little bit patient, um, especially when it comes to corporations making the change and there will be failures and it's okay to completely fail. Just admit it <laughs> and tell us how you're going to move forward. And that's the most, that, that's the advice we give to all brands that just admit your failure, tell us something concrete that you're going to do, but come back in a couple months and tell us how you did it. Interesting. Well said, Quinn. That was great. I agree with you. I think the fact this black and white, you know, you're either good or you're bad. I mean, companies are run by human beings and it is a constant improvement. I mean, I, I can tell you from a media perspective, the way I've treated it at my company, you know, I'm like, you can't just do one thing. It, it's just not that. I mean, to me, the, the way that our brands can make the greatest impact is to have people of color all throughout the year. And so it's great to do that wonderful story about the bakers for racism. And of course, Taste of Home should do that. And they did do it. But it's really about every time you turn a page, whether it's on your website or a magazine, that there are a mixed group of people to the point that you no longer say, oh, look, that's unusual. You know, such and such brand had a black person. So I think that if we make that part of the fabric of who we are, then we are really moving the needle. And we have a big editorial, we have a diversity task force, but we have an editorial diversity group. And they are really working on that. And um, it's been really exciting to find things. So Birds and Blooms, we found out that there's a black birders group. And, you know, just to let people know that, that that exists, but not just for today, you know, what what are we going to do next month and the, and the month after and to, you know, as you turn the pages of Reader's Digest, which has always covered people of color and always covered immigrants, but, you know, do we need to do more, you know, and, and, and I think that, um, you know, that that is a way that we can help move this fractured country forward. It's through storytelling and imagery. And mm -hmm are two very powerful ways to make a difference. You have a really interesting portfolio too in the sense that I would suspect that the vast majority of them are sort of the Midwestern bread and butter Americans, right? And South and the South, yeah, we, we very, you know, very white, um, but, but um, I would say very, uh, they're about goodness, right? So uh -huh. if you're a Reader's Digest, you're about helping your community. If you're a Taste of Home, you are the person who makes all the best meals at the Sunday church pot, you know, potluck. So mm -hmm. are very, very community minded. Um, and in that way, I think that they do want to help others and regardless of, of the situation. Yeah, I think you make a really good point, Bonnie, especially as the leader of a media company that you're threading the needle again across everything. It's not one thing anymore. Um, and that, that just takes time, you know, it takes a lot of time, you know, brands, like brands are human beings too. And mm -hmm. you know, I definitely have had my share of talking to founders or CEOs and confessing, oh my God, I don't have anyone of color on my executive team. What do I do about it? Well, you're not going to be able to do something overnight, you know, obviously with that. Um, but how do you, you know, all those small steps to take to dismantle this way of thinking, um, is so critical and, and just keeping threading that needle every single day on every single decision is what's going to really make change um, versus like, you know, a heartfelt Instagram post. <laughs> yeah, one thing, just my like addition to this is that what's different now, I think, is there's like, these companies have a lot of pressure internally, like their employees are the ones that are making them do stuff now, which is, you know, feels like a, um, you know, a, a shift and it's harder for them to explain away with an Instagram post or, you know, saying we made a task force or whatever, like their employees come to work every day and are like, what are you doing? What did you do today? Like, what did you do tomorrow? Like, what are you going to do next week? And I think they, there has the people, the brands we work with have had a very hard time communicating to their employees 
that, you know, I think that the majority of them are good hearted and they want to do the right thing. And like, they are not up to the challenge of a doing it <laughs> or, but B communicating to their rank and file about how they're doing it. Um, even the ones that are like trying to take steps. And I think that I'm, I think that that pressure, this isn't really like, I don't know, this isn't so much of a content question, but I think that pressure internally is, is really kind of valuable and I think it's not going away. I think that sort of like these guys are going to have to continually deal with this. And I think that employees who have to, who are there every day and are in the Slack group or, and are in the emails or, and are talking to people are a lot less easily placated than sort of the general public. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think you're right, Sam. I think that Facebook's um, biggest challenge is not the ad um, boycott, but actually their employees who are, um, the most coveted, educated, have a lot of places they can go <clears throat> in this job market. Um, and that's more dangerous to them than, than a, you know, a, a one month long ad boycott. I think Mark Zuckerberg even said it, oh, they'll be back. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? um, but you know, employees can, you know, those, those, those employees, especially at Facebook, can find other places to go quite easily. Yeah, and like I said, every single one of our clients is facing that, like all of them, they're all run by white guys, almost all of them. And all of them have like employees who are like, what are you going to do about the fact that there's no diversity on the executive team and yeah. in the company in general? And, and Bonnie, how does that reflect into kind of the situation you find your, yourself in? I know you had said previously that m many, many, many of your employees are here in Milwaukee. Um, and one of the challenges here is that we, we both were not really affected by COVID as much outside of the city and also, at least not yet. Um, and also, uh, you know, personally, some, and Chair and I are having a moment. Uh, personally, <laughs> um, excuse me. Uh, anyway, uh, that, that your staff were trying to, we're, we're struggling both uh, with both uh, COVID and social justice almost at the same time. Yeah, I think for, um, I think COVID, it, again, because of our location was like the story, of, the tale of two different cities, right? So the, the New York team was highly, highly impacted by COVID and Milwaukee and Minneapolis were, you know, some of them simply didn't even know anyone who got sick, let alone really sick or, or, or died. Whereas in New York, we all knew people that died, um, I, at least anyone that I spoke to did. And so that was very different. Um, but I think they took it seriously and um, they did want to go back to work sooner. I don't think anyone in Manhattan is asking to go back in the office to the same extent. Um, and so we did open our test kitchens in Milwaukee and they, we have a lot of rules, uh, a lot, a lot of rules, but they are back and not every day, but um, I think they feel really good about it. Uh, so that's just a fraction of the Milwaukee team, but the people who need to go test recipes in the kitchen and have better photography than their iPhones. Um, and then Family Handyman at just outside of Minneapolis, they also went back to go into the, um, into the workshop, but Minneapolis, most of our team lives within 14 blocks of where um, George Floyd was murdered. And that was a tremendous impact on that team. Uh, I had two employees that had to physically move because they were really in the midst of the rampage. And I think our entire company, even though that's a relatively small office for us, it's 30 people, but um, there was a huge, obviously outcrying of support for our, our, our staff there. Um, but, you know, I think that in some ways it's probably brought our employees all closer together because there's been these different challenges in the different offices. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been sending out a weekly note that I committed doing, never knowing I was going to be home for so long, I might add. But every time I send a note out and I get all these notes saying, I look forward to your Friday update. Um, and so never having considered myself to be a writer, um, I'm really getting into it. And I, I shared a poem last week by Mary Oliver, and I do a lot of quotable quotes. Um, but I also feel like those notes have been a way of me sharing things that are happening in these different locations um, and bringing everyone together so that there's common information, even though your experience, you know, could be so very different 
from someone in another one of our offices. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, our staff has always been remote, but I don't know that we've all been quite so distributed um, since mm -hmm. most people left New York, except for Sabrina. Uh, but go Sabrina. Uh, someone needs to check the mailbox someday. <laughs> um, uh, talk to me a little bit. So we have a couple of different questions that have come back in. Uh, one was the uh, specifically about budgeting, and I think we addressed that a bit. Um, but the other one is from, I but I know who it's from, just given uh, who's here. Uh, what, in your opinion, is the best approach for a brand awareness for a highly technical or even esoteric brand or project, product content during this new cycle and social environment? Um, Quinn, can you speak to what you're thinking about there? And then maybe Sam? Um, I always say, don't be afraid to go weird. Weird works. <laughs> you know, I think that, um, people get so worried about that, but you know, we're living in meme culture and you, you know, and I, and I joke, poor avocado toast. I don't have anything against it. Um, but if you see, you know, you've seen one, you've seen them all. Um, so I think, and again, not knowing what your product is, I think don't, don't be afraid to be weird. Don't be afraid to be odd. Um, think about ASMR, somebody sitting there whispering into a microphone, touching items. Um, you know, one of my favorite Instagram accounts is this really sweet Japanese girl who bakes cakes. Bonnie, this might be for you. And she smushes it on her face. <laughs> <laughs> and it's wildly, you know, interesting to me. And it stops me every single time. So I think that if you do have an esoteric brand or something, go weird with it. It's totally fine. Just find, find, your, find your weirdness. Let your freak flag fly. People who will be attracted to that will be attracted to your product and you will stand out. Uh, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong. I also love bread face. Bread face is great. Uh, there's, there's lots of stuff like that too. I think these niche accounts that we're all starting to follow because we've spent way too much time on Instagram and YouTube and wherever else you might find yourself on TikTok, obviously. Um, that, that we're just looking for ways to integrate those sorts of portfolios into our client accounts, especially when they very obviously go viral for something completely weird. Um, I also love following like uninfluencers or uh, any of the other brands that are just really specific and are like very nuanced and, and, and odd to, to engage with. But uh, in the case of the, uh, person who asked the question, you know, work with things like how it's made, work with things like specialty tools, work with places that create um, thing, like cult, uh, consumer con cultures that come from a desire to literally watch how the iron becomes steel, becomes a hammer, you know, um, or, uh, or on another element of it, people are looking for industry trends, talk about exactly how we got from wherever we were in February and March to now, and then look at all of the different ways that we can project that those things will change. Um, because I think people are just looking for real information and being a provider of real information is something that a brand can do as well as a magazine or mm -hmm. other media entity. Um, and I would only add to that that it's really important that when people think about content creation is, you know, going back to the message is the medium, the medium really shapes your message. So you first have to decide where your message is going to live and then craft what medium, I'm sorry, what medium your message is going to live on first. Think of that first and then think about what message uh, makes the most sense according to that medium. So, you know, we'll often say to somebody, here's the big idea for your campaign or your concept, but the iteration on Twitter versus Facebook versus Facebook stories versus Instagram, Instagram stories versus TikTok, you know, it, it needs to really live within that medium. So going back to Kate, what's Kate said, you know, don't, it, one size definitely does not fit all anymore online in digital. So you have to craft that main message, but then let it iterate in many, many different formats wherever you're, you're going to be. Because on Pinterest, you should probably be an infographic. <laughs> yeah, and I think to just to like, my two cents on the question is kind of things that are highly specific and highly technical and really kind of like esoteric 
are really good opportunities to get user generated content or to get the community involved because typically, you know, these communities that are small and niche are passionate, right? And like, a, you know, a single kind of like commenter or user or whatever can really, you know, if the community is small enough, like that person is heard um, in a way that like, you know, giant mass media topics like an individual did, isn't really going to have, um, you know, isn't going to have much of a voice. And so, <clears throat> yeah, like my sense is you lean into the community um, and you, you know, respect the community and treat the community as equals. And, you know, that I think is a really valuable, you know, way to activate a niche group. And it sounds like if the product's esoteric, like the niche group is exactly who you want. And they're actually going to be our buyers too, right? right? There are very few people who are going to want to buy a hammer who aren't a person like if, uh, in a hammer is euphemism, but like who wants to follow. Like a samurai sword. Is exactly. What right. Yeah. Um, or like I have become an influencer on Reddit's water skiing. Uh, me and primarily because I'm the only person who posts every, a picture every day, you know, stuff like that is really easy for a person to establish. And once you establish a working relationship with them, you can have a lot of conversations about everything from technique to utility to, to delivery. And I think people have had this opportunity to get so into their hobbies and so nuanced on their careers that both types of content uh, in those situations are, are really useful. Um, Bonnie, can you talk about how your brands are servicing their audiences uh, very deliberately? Like what's a case study of something that, that, that has come to life uh, during uh, stay at home, et cetera? Sure, so, um, you know, call it fortuitous timing, but just before COVID we had launched um, a community called Bakeable, and uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a, a, a closed. We knew. It's a right. We knew. We had advance notice. Um, it's a both a part of our site, but also it's its own Facebook group. You have to um, apply to be part of Bakeable, and um, it's just been amazing because first of all, people who bake love to share and people who bake don't stop baking. And so during this time, um, there's just so much more going on. And so we do a monthly challenge for the bakeable community. And so people are um, making that and then posting those photos, but they're also um, asking questions or showing off some of the most spectacularly de uh, decorated uh, cakes. And um, it's just been great to see that grow and, and to see how much content is consumed, right? These people are not just satisfied with that one recipe, but they want to look at more and more and more. So um, I think the team is so proud of that and um, has been able to invest that much more. And I think to the point of creating content at home, um, that it really gave all of our test kitchen and culinary staff the opportunity to create content at home in a way that they never would have in our test kitchens. And I think that was a lot of fun to sort of become a little bit more known because Taste of Home is a brand about the home cook. And now it was a little bit about learning who that person was who was making that recipe. And I think that was a really cool shift to, um, to allow the staff to become more, more known and more personal. And I think that will continue. Um, in a really positive way. So I guess those would be two examples. Well, it's kind of like the economist byline suddenly turning into a human. Yeah. Magical new world. Uh, so we have two very specific questions from, from uh, our ASMR specialist, Sabrina McMillan. Uh, Quinn, uh, who is your favorite ASMR artist? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I have moved away from ASMR because now I'm into TikTok dancers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so on trend. I'm sorry. I'm 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 a teenager at heart, guys. I just say young. Um, I would say um, I, I'm not going to say this wrong, but I'm really into to mutt bangers. You know, those people who eat like copious amounts of food. Um, I know it sounds really disgusting, but one of the things I really like about it is. Um, you can, you're sitting across the table from somebody and it's almost like you're having a meal, though they're eating like, you know, four pies at the same time. So I've been a little bit more obsessed on that. I can come back to you. I haven't done ASMR in a little while, 
but I can come back to you to see who, to, I can share with Kate and she can share with you who's trending right now. Um, but a lot of what I've been looking at are um, mudbangers who eat too much because, you know, I've been cooking a lot. And I would say TikTok dancers are kind of amazing. I mean, the things that they're doing. So um, I'm not as current on ASMR. I'm sorry, Kate. I will it's give all you good. You got it, Quinn. I'll give you a little list, though. <laughs> Uh, and then the last uh, uh, question, and we only have about one, two minutes left. Uh, what's your favorite book about all this stuff? Sam, what do you read? What have you read? Uh, I'm illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> I read Instagram. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, this is so unhelpful, but I try never to read books that have anything to do with my work. <laughs> so... I'm currently reading Bartleby the Scrivener, which is a novella by Herman Melville that seemed appropriate for COVID. And I just finished a book called Zone One, which is about a zombie apocalypse that happens in lower Manhattan. And it, I, it's a great book, but it's a little too close to home. So I would not recommend that to anybody. Uh-huh. <laughs> Bonnie, do you read books about work or are we all reading novels because there's work is um, I am not currently reading um, a book about work, but a book that I would recommend to anyone that's in the content uh, world is called The Content Trap. Mm -hmm. um, it's really quite, quite good and thoughtful and actually my whole team and I, we read it together and we still reference it because I think that one of the things about being in the content business is that you can start feeling like more and more and more and more and more. And that is a great way to mm -hmm. not <laughs> build your community. <laughs> and I think for us, we, we really keep that in mind because we do have, we do create a lot of content, but we want it to be content for the purpose. And I think it goes back to sort of the way you started this panel, which is, you know, what's your benefit? Um, and it could, and your benefit could be entertainment, but other than that, your content creation should always play a role in, in somebody else's life. And um, so I think we are always mindful of not falling into the content trap. So Sam, if you ever read a business book, I would say that's a good one to read. Excellent, done. <laughs> Go on Amazon right now. Uh, so uh, just cause uh, we have one minute of Bonnie's time left. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm still Kate from Gray Horse and it was fantastic having so many people come from all over the world. Um, according to Anne Marie in the chat right this second, our next event is on July 23rd at 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, all of the deets are uh, in the chat and uh, you can register there. Uh, that one will be me, my father, and a financial expert talking about the best and worst parts of the PPP money and where we ended up after all of that. Um, it is cool. extremely practical this, uh, discussion for those of us who own businesses, and it's also a lot of free advice. Uh, last time we had more than 50 questions come in uh, from left, right, and center about what to do about all this money that we got, and also what to do since it's all gone. Um, so come back for that, and if you have any other questions or if you'd like to host a panel of your very own with me, feel free to reach out. I see a whole bunch of people who have some really interesting resumes. Uh, in our chat. Uh, thanks to Sam, Bonnie, and Quinn for joining us, and I look Thank forward you. to seeing you somewhere on the internet sometime soon. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank this you. Is great. This is great. Talk Bye, soon. Guys.